The Case for Oneness Theology, Part 1. Apostolic faith Christians are known as Oneness Apostolic Faith Christians because we believe that the first century apostles taught oneness monotheism rather than so-called Trinitarian, Arian, or Sicinian monotheism. The designation apostolic faith simply means the faith of the original apostles of Jesus Christ. We are also known as oneness Pentecostals because we believe that the true church of the living God was founded on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God was first poured out in the New Testament church and all new converts were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. The historical designation for the oneness Pentecostal view was once known as modalistic monarchianism within the first few centuries of the Christian era. According to the historical evidence, the modalistic monarchians were once known as the majority of believers, according to Tertullian against Praxis chapter 3 in the late 2nd into the early 3rd century, and as the general run of Christians in the early days of Christianity, according to Origen's commentary of the Gospel of John, book 1, chapter 23, in the beginning part of the 3rd century. The definition of modalistic monarchianism. Merriam-Webster succinctly defines modalism as three modes or forms of activity. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit under which God manifests himself. Monarchianism simply means a belief in one ruler. Monarch comes from mono, meaning one, and arch meaning ruler. Hence, modalistic monarchianism is the belief that God is one monarch as a single ruler who has manifested himself in three modes of activity. Prominent oneness theologians like David K. Bernard have rightly affirmed that modern-day oneness Pentecostals believe the same basic tenets of faith as the modalistic monarchian Christian majority in the first 300 years of Christian history. David Bernard wrote in his book, The Oneness of God, page 318, and I quote, Basically, modalism is the same as the modern doctrine of oneness. Oneness meaning one God who was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit as the man Christ Jesus. Even the opponents of the ancient oneness modalists wrote that the modalistic monarchians were always the majority of believers in the West and the general run of Christians in the East. Tertullian of Carthage not only acknowledged that the oneness modalists were the majority in his day, he also affirmed that they were always the Christian majority as far back as he knew. In the West, in Carthage, Tertullian had written, they that always make up the majority of believers were the oneness modalists, the modalistic monarchians, against Praxis chapter 3. Adolf Harnack wrote that modalistic monarchianism was once embraced by the great majority of all Christians. Although we are now persecuted as a minority, we still believe the same theology of the great majority of Christians in the first 300 years of Christian history. Oneness believers affirm that God as a single monarch, as a single ruler and king, who has manifested himself as our Heavenly Father in creation, Son in redemption, and as the Holy Spirit as the Father's own spirit in action. For God the Father's own Holy Spirit came down from heaven. Jesus said, I came down from heaven in John 6, 38. Luke 1, 35 says the Holy Spirit came down from heaven over the virgin to manifest himself in the flesh, being justified by that Holy Spirit. So God the Father's own Holy Spirit came down from heaven and his own word, his own expressed thought was made flesh according to John 1, 14 to become the Holy Christ child. Thus, oneness adherents believe 
that the one God, who is the Holy Spirit of the Father, also became one man, who is the Son, in order to save his people from their sins. The first century apostles taught that there is only one God as our Heavenly Father, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The scriptures clearly teach that there's only one God and Father above all, through all, and in you all. The scriptures also clearly teach that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was a man, attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him. So we know that the one God and Father above all, through all, and is now in us all, is that one God who was manifested in the flesh to become a true man. For the one God also became one man in the incarnation through the virgin. Hence, the one God the Father was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, according to 1 Timothy 2.5, as the man Christ Jesus, because Jesus is that God who came to save us as a true man living among men. Paul wrote to the Corinthians that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. No text of scripture ever states that an alleged angelic figure was ever in Christ Jesus. That is the doctrine of Arianism, like Jehovah's Witnesses. Nor does any text of scripture ever state that an alleged God the Son or God the Christ was in Christ to reconcile the world to himself. That's the doctrine of Trinitarianism. Because God the Father is always spoken of in Scripture as being in the Son. Jesus clearly said, the Father abiding in me, he's the one doing the works. That's the doctrine of modalism. Because the divinity of Jesus is the divinity of the Father's person as a man person. So, God the Father was in the Son and being seen through the Son. Jesus clearly said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. And he that sees me sees the one who sent me. That is why Jesus as the Son of God is called the image of the invisible God, according to Colossians 1.15, as the image of the invisible Father. Because God copied or reproduced an image of himself because God's substance of being, his essence of being, through his own Holy Spirit came down from heaven and reproduced a man shell from his own essence of being to have a life in himself as a distinct human. So the distinction between the Father and Son is an ontological distinction because God as God, according to Numbers 23, 19, is not a man nor a son of man. But when God became a man, that shows the distinction between the Son, who is the man, who was born with a beginning, and the God, who is the mighty God and everlasting Father, who was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. The words God the Father, or similar designations such as God our Father, and God and Father, appear more than 30 times in the New Testament. But we never find a single example of an alleged God the Son, or a God the Holy Spirit ever occurring in inspired scripture, not even once. There is a reason why God always led the apostles and prophets to write God the Father, rather than God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. Because the scriptures state that our Heavenly Father is the only true God, and there is no true God beside Him. Jesus said that the Father is the only true God in John 17, 3. And God said, there is no God beside me in Isaiah 45, 5. Thus, the man Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, as the image of the invisible Father, because there's no true God person beside the Father. So Jesus is, is beside the Father as a man, but there's no true God beside him. That makes Jesus that true God, the Father, who was manifest in the flesh as a man, as the image of the invisible God, the image of the invisible Father. Hence, the scriptures teach only one divine individual God person as our Heavenly Father, which is the oneness doctrine, 
who has only one divine mind, one divine will, one divine soul, one divine spirit, and one divine consciousness, rather than three sets of distinct divine consciousness. Three divine minds, three divine wills, three divine souls. That's the doctrine of Trinitarianism, which sounds tritheistic to us oneness believers. Moreover, the Son of God is that same individual God who entered into his creation to become a true man with a distinct human mind, a distinct human will, a distinct human soul, and a distinct human spirit, as well as a distinct human consciousness. Because if Jesus did not have a distinct human spirit, he would not have been born alive. Because as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So if Jesus didn't have a human spirit, he couldn't be a true man at all. He would have been dead. He couldn't have been born alive. This is precisely what we would expect if we are to believe that the Spirit of God came down from heaven in order to become a true man who could pray and be tempted. The scriptures clearly says that Jesus was a true man who was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. As a true man in the incarnation through the Hebrew virgin, he had to be led by the Spirit like any other man because God truly became a true man living among men who could pray and be tempted. According to oneness theologian Jason Dooley, he affirmed that the oneness position affirms that we believe that Jesus was God from his birth because it was God who became a man. So, the oneness position, oneness theology believes that God, who is the unchangeable God in the heavens, he always retains all of his divine attributes, such as omnipresence and omniscience. That one God also was manifest in the flesh to become a true man. And if God became a man, he would have to have a human spirit, a human nature, a human mind who could be tempted. According to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, the scripture says, This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged in marriage to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through or of the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for through or of is ek, which literally means out of. So she was found to be with child out of the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, a righteous man was unwilling to disgrace her publicly. He resolved to divorce her quietly. But after he had pondered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the one conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. The Greek text is the preposition ek which literally means out of. So the text should really read, for the one conceived in her is out of the Holy Spirit. Strong's Concordance says that ek means from out, out from among, from the interior outwards. Helps Word Studies says that ek is one of the most under-translated and therefore mistranslated Greek prepositions often being confined to the meaning of by. So we find that the word ek is often mistranslated in the Bible. It shouldn't mean by, it shouldn't mean just from or of, it means from out of, or out from, or literally out from something. If we look at Matthew 1.5, according to the genealogical table of the birth of Christ, Matthew 1.5 uses the same Greek preposition ek for Boaz being begotten out of Rahab. And again, Matthew 1.5 also says that Obed was begotten from out of Ruth. Out of Ruth. Then we turn to Galatians 4.4, 4, we find that Jesus Christ was of or ek from out of Mary. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, 
made of, Greek preposition, ek, made out of a woman, made under the law. So according to Galatians 4.4, 4, the son was made out of Mary, the woman. Now, if we look at the same Greek preposition for the Virgin Mary, we compare that with Galatians 4.4, 4, and then again in Matthew 1.20, we find that Jesus was made ek out of the woman, and Jesus was again produced ek out of the Holy Spirit. So the same Greek preposition ek, for out of the woman, the Virgin Mary, in Galatians 4.4, 4, is the same Greek preposition used for the sons made from women in the genealogical table of Matthew chapter 1. Thus, the normative use of ek for out of the woman leads us to believe that Christ was made out of the human genetics of Mary and out of the divine essence of being of the Holy Spirit who came down from heaven upon the Virgin. Therefore, the Christ child was clearly made by being conceived out of Mary and out of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1, 18-20 says, For the one conceived in her is ek, out of the Holy Spirit. Out of 21 major translations I checked, not a single translation says that the Christ child was conceived out of or from out of the Holy Spirit. This leads me to believe that the Trinitarian Greek scholars who gave us the New Testament in English were uncomfortable with the words out of the Holy Spirit because a Trinitarian Jesus could not come out of the Holy Spirit while being a timeless God the Son. That sounds ridiculous. The Son was, came out of the Holy Spirit? He was produced out of the essence of being of the Holy Spirit. He should already, he should be the Son coming down from heaven, not the Holy Spirit coming down from heaven. So, this seems nonsensical. That's why I believe the Trinitarian scholars did not put from out of or out of the Holy Spirit in Matthew 1.20 and Matthew 1.18. Nor could a timeless God the Son have been reproduced or copied from the essence of being of the Father. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says that Jesus Christ is the brightness of his glory and the reproduced copy of his essence of being. The King James Version in Hebrews 1 3 says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Express image is from the Greek word character, which means a reproduced copy. Jesus is the reproduction, the copy, as the express copy of the Father's person as a human person. Now, many oneness Pentecostals do not like to say the word person for God, but even the King James Bible in Hebrews 1.3 states that Jesus Christ is the brightness of His, the Father's glory, and is the express image of His person. So, God is a single individual, whether you want to call him a person or not, it still applies to God because God calls himself a soul throughout the Hebrew Bible, which we'll get into later. The soul of a person really means the inner person himself. A soul is a person, and a person is a soul. Back in the Bible days, we don't have the same English word person, but if you go throughout the Hebrew Scriptures and the Greek Scriptures, we find people being referred to as souls instead of persons. So the word person essentially means the same thing as a soul. So Jesus Christ, according to Hebrews 1.3, is the brightness of His, the Father's glory, and the express image of His, the Father's person, as a fully complete human person. Because God's essence of being was reproduced or copied as an image of the invisible Father with us as a visible man, with a human spirit, human mind, human body. Thus, it is clear that the gospel in the original Greek shows that the man Christ Jesus was supernaturally conceived out of the Holy Spirit's essence of being and out of the human genetics of the Virgin Mary. Therefore, the divinity of Jesus came out of the Holy Spirit, which refutes Trinitarianism while affirming oneness theology. 
while at least some of the physical human attributes of Jesus came out of Mary. Oneness theologian Jason Dooley correctly explained what Oneness theology teaches about God becoming a man in the Incarnation through the Virgin. And I quote from Jason Dooley, We believe that Jesus was God from his birth because it was God who became a man. Seeing an absolute ontological and hypostatic union between Christ's two natures, in opposition to Nestorianism, which sees them as separated. We believe that Jesus' humanity could not have existed apart from the Father, because it was the Father who contributed to his human existence, obviously by the Holy Spirit, who came down upon the Virgin. Just as we could not exist apart from the contribution of our mother and father, Jesus' humanity could not exist apart from the contribution of both the Father, the Holy Spirit of the Father, and Mary. Because remember, the scripture says in Matthew 1, 20, that the Holy Spirit is the spirit that reproduced a man-child. The child which is conceived in her is of, ek, out of, the Holy Spirit. So the contribution of the Father came out of the Holy Spirit and ek out of the woman. Galatians 4, 4, out of Mary. In other words, we do not conceive of it even being possible that Jesus could ever be just a man. We do not attribute absolute deity to Jesus Christ simply because God was in him. Jesus is ontologically divine and human from his conception and could never be anything but God manifested in the flesh. There was never a time when the Spirit of God was not in Christ, or a time when Jesus' humanity ever existed apart from the contribution of God. End quote. So God contributed to Christ's person, his being. He came out of the essence of being of the Father's Holy Spirit who came down from heaven. Hebrews 1.3 clearly says that it was the Father's essence, substance of being. Hypostasis is used in Hebrews 1.3. Jesus Christ is the brightness of His, the Father's glory. He is the express image of His, the Father's person, copied or reproduced as the image of the invisible God, the express image of the Father's person. The scriptural teaching of both the full humanity and deity of Jesus Christ was also taught by the post-apostolic fathers who immediately succeeded the apostles in the late 1st century and early 2nd centuries. Ignatius was appointed the third bishop of Antioch by the apostle John himself within the 1st century. So it is hard to imagine that the teachings of Ignatius would have been different from the apostle John himself. Ignatius of Antioch wrote to Polycarp, chapter 3, verse 2, Look for him who is above time, the timeless, the invisible, who for our sake became visible, the impassable, who became subject to suffering on our account, and for our sake endured everything. Now we're talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ suffered for us, and on our account, he endured everything. So Ignatius clearly taught that the one invisible God became visible for our sake. Ignatius, who was taught by the original apostles, wrote that the God who became visible was first invisible before his birth. Trinitarians often affirm that the Son was visible as one of the angels of Yahweh or Christophanes in the Hebrew Scriptures, while the Father was invisible. But according to Ignatius and the earliest Christian witness of the first and early second century, the only invisible God later became the visible Son who was subject to sufferings on our account. Thus, Ignatius, who was taught and mentored by the Apostle John himself, refuted the later Trinitarian doctrine. Because the Trinitarians are saying that the Son has always been visible in the Old Testament. He was in the visible form of God before his incarnation. They say that Philippians 2, that Jesus was in a form of God, a visible form of God before his supernatural conception and birth. But Philippians 2 does not say that. Philippians 2 says that Jesus was in the form of God 
as a man on the earth. He was made that form, he was made that image out of the Holy Spirit and out of the Virgin Mary. So Ignatius clearly refutes Trinitarianism and he was taught by the apostles themselves in the first century. Not a single early Christian writer ever spoke of an alleged timeless eternal son until the third century. Church historian Johannes Quassen admitted that the first Christian writer to speak of a timeless eternal son was Origen of Alexandria in the third century. According to Quassen, the doctrine of the eternality of the son was a remarkable advance in the development of theology and had a far-reaching influence on ecclesiastical teachings. End quote. Mathetus claimed to be a disciple of the apostles. In the 11th chapter of Mathetus to Diognetus, Mathetus presented himself as having been a disciple of the apostles. According to Mathetus, the God who became the Son was not always called the Son until today. And I quote, This is he, being from everlasting, is today called the Son. So, the God, who has always been from everlasting, is today called the Son. In other words, he was not called the Son until today. That's why Luke 135 says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child, which shall be born of you, shall be called the Son of God. So, Jesus was called the Son of God because the Holy Spirit came down from heaven to conceive the Christ child. That's why he's called the son, because of the virgin conception and birth. Mathis speaks of Christ as being the he who is from everlasting, but is today called the son. According to Mathis, the son was not actually called the son until today, until these last days. Same thing as Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God spoke in time past to the fathers, to the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. So the son was not called a son. The son was not alive to be a son until these last days because God was never a son before. God was manifest in the flesh, in the incarnation. Hence, the son is the man who had a beginning while existing from everlasting as the mighty God and everlasting father, according to Isaiah 9, 6. Mathetus further encouraged the early Christians to esteem Jesus as our Father in his epistle to Diognetus chapter 9. He wrote, Esteem him our nourisher, Father, teacher, counselor, healer, our wisdom, light, honor, glory, power, and life. So according to Mathetus, Christians esteem Jesus as our Father. Ignatius went on to write to the Ephesians chapter 7 verse 2, there is one physician who is possessed both of flesh and spirit, both made and not made. Meaning Jesus was made, or his flesh was created, his humanity, his human nature was created, and not made. His divinity could never have been created, because he goes on to say God existing in flesh. God as God is not created. So according to his humanity, the human nature, the sonship, the man was made. But his true existence as God was not made, because he's God existing in flesh, true life and death, both of Mary, his humanity, Mary had contributed to his humanity, and of God, the Holy Spirit, also contributed to his person, because the Holy Spirit united himself with humanity in the incarnation through the Virgin. So he's both of Mary, human, and of God, divine by God's own Holy Spirit, who reproduced the man-child as the image of the invisible God. He was first passable, then impassable, even Jesus Christ our Lord." End quote. Ignatius clearly believed that the Son of God was produced both of, ek, out of Mary, and of, ek, out of God. Thus, according to Ignatius, the Son of God was both made, created, and not made, not created. Because the human aspect of his being is the Son who had a beginning by his beginning. Whilst the divine aspect of his being is the Father who continued to exist outside of the Incarnation as the uncreated God without a beginning. 
Therefore, Ignatius taught that Jesus is the uncreated God existing in flesh. For God as God is not made, nor does God as God have a beginning. Matthew 1.20 and Luke 1.35 prove that the child born and son given came from out of the Holy Spirit. The context of Matthew chapter 1 shows that Joseph was about to put away his espoused wife because he had thought that the child had been conceived from out of another man. Not out of the Holy Spirit substance of being, but out of the being of another man. That is why the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream to inform him that the child was not conceived out of another man, but out of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the man Christ Jesus received his divinity from out of the Holy Spirit of the only true God the Father himself, because Hebrews 1.3 informs us that he was reproduced as an imprinted copy, character means imprinted copy, of the Father's essence or substance of being. Hypostasis in Hebrews 1.3 means essence or substance of being. As a fully complete human being. So the Father, Spirit, came down from heaven, the Holy Spirit, and reproduced a man-child out of his own essence or substance of being, as a fully complete human being, who was made, according to Hebrews 2.17, fully human in every way via incarnation through the Virgin Mary. Hebrews 1.3 in the King James Version says that the Son is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Now, again, a lot of one is Pentecostals. We don't like to say person for God, but even the King James Version says that God is a person. The Father is a person here. So the divinity, now Jesus is a human person, okay? Because God, the Father's person, became a human person. That's not two divine persons. No, there's only one divine individual person called the Heavenly Father, who also became a human person. Now, that's not God as two divine persons, but that's God as the Father, and that's God who also became a man as a human person. That explains how the Father and the Son could have a relationship, because the Father's divine person was able to communicate with the human aspect of existence as a human person, because Jesus Christ is fully human in every way, with a human spirit, a human mind, human nature, who had an independent existence as to his humanity. That's why it says in John 5, 26, As the Father has life in himself, so has he granted the Son a life in himself. The Father has a distinct life in himself as the Father, but the humanity of the Son has a distinct life in himself. That means Jesus had to be made fully human in every way. Jesus did not know all things. Mark 13, 32, he didn't know the day and the hour of his own second coming. But as to his deity outside of the incarnation, he knew all things, but not in the incarnation as a son, as the man. Because the man is not ontologically God with us as God, but it's ontologically God with us as an ontological man, a human being. So the context of Hebrews 1, 1 through 5 says, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son in Hebrews 1, 5. So we're not talking about a pre-incarnate God the Son here. Nor are we talking about an angelic created Son. We're talking about a Son who had his beginning in time through the incarnation through the Virgin Mary. So the context of Hebrews 1, 1 through 5 proves that the Son of God is the man who had his beginning by his begetting, by his virgin conception and birth. For the words, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son, in Hebrews 1.5, prove that the father was not always a father to the son, nor was the son always a son to his father. Hence, the man Christ Jesus was clearly granted a life in himself, according to John 5.26, by being reproduced from the father's essence of being to become a fully complete human being through the virgin. The man Christ Jesus is therefore the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of the Father's person as a fully complete human person. This is exactly what we would expect if we are to believe that the one God also became a man within the Hebrew virgin. 
the scriptures inform us that God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, because the Holy Spirit of God came down from heaven to become fully human in every way. Jesus in Hebrew means Yahweh is salvation as our Emmanuel, God with us, because his true identity is our God with us as a true man living among men. According to Strong's exhaustive concordance, the short definition of character is an exact reproduction. A reproduction is something copied from an original. Thayer's Greek lexicon says that character means the mark, figure, or letters stamped upon that instrument or wrought out on it. Hence, universally, a mark or figure burned in, burned in, or stamped on an impression, the exact expression image of any person or thing marked likeness. Precise reproduction in every res respect. From the same as carax, a graver, the tool, or the person, by implication engraving char character, the figure stamp, an exact copy, figuratively a representation express image. So we find that the wide range of meaning of the Greek word character proves that Jesus was made an image, an exact reproduction, a copy, an exact copy, according to Strong's, of the Father's person as a fully complete human person. Professor Barry Smith of Atlantic Baptist University wrote in his exegesis on the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 3, and I quote, The Greek word character can mean the literal imprint of something, that which corresponds to the die. Relatedly, it can refer to something as the copy of an original. This is confirmed by an inscription on a statue of Antiochus that reads, Exact image of my form. Here we can see that the ancient Greeks often used the Greek word character as an exact image as a statue of a single human person. This would mean that Jesus is the exact visible image of the invisible Father's person. Therefore, the Greek word character used in Hebrews 1.3 proves that Jesus is the image of the invisible God as the exact image of the invisible Father's person as a visible human person. Thus, Hebrews 1.3 proves that the Son of God is the brightness of His, the Father's glory, and the express image of His, the Father's person, as a true human person who could suffer, pray, and die for our sins. Brightness in Hebrews 1.3 is translated from apogospa. It means reflected brightness. So Jesus is the reflected brightness of the Father's glory in the context of Hebrews 1.3 because the Son of God is the image of the invisible Father, image of the invisible Father's reflected glory. In other words, Jesus is not the source of the glory. He reflects the divine glory of the Father's glory as the image of the invisible Father with us as a true man. If Jesus was a co-equal God of the Son, he should have his own distinct glory. But no, Jesus reflects the glory of the Father's divine essence of being because Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God as God with us as a man. For if the Son of God is an alleged co-equally distinct God the Son person, then he would have his own co-equally distinct brightness and glory rather than merely reflecting the brightness and glory of the Father's divine person as a human person. Therefore, the Son of God could not be another co-equally distinct God person like Trinitarians suppose, because he is Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God with us as a fully complete man, fully human in every way according to Hebrews 2.17. Hence, we have only one divinity, who is God the Father, and only one image of that invisible Father who also became a true man. The Son of God is a man, because a son is a man and a man is a son. God is not a son. God is not a man. Numbers 23, 19 says God is not a son of man. He's not a son. So God is not ontologically a son. So when Jesus was, God was manifested in the flesh as Jesus, the Son of God, 
Jesus is not God the Father with us as God the Father. He's God the Father with us as an ontologically distinct human being who is fully human in every way, just like his brethren, just like all humans are made. So we have one divine divinity who was our heavenly Father, and only one image of that divine divinity of our Father who became a true man as the image of the invisible God through the Hebrew virgin in order to save his people from their sins. This is precisely what the vast majority of the early Christians taught within the first few centuries of the Christian era before the Trinity doctrine was developed. Hermas of Rome was a contemporary of the first century Apostle Paul. Romans 16, 14 mentions Hermas in Rome. Hermas, Shepherd of Hermas, Vision 3, 5 says that some of the apostles were still with us, still alive at the time that Hermas was written. So we know that Hermas of Rome was a contemporary of the first century Apostle Paul and of the first century Roman Bishop Clement. Hermas Vision 2.4 records the words of an angel saying to Hermas, and I quote, You will write therefore two books, and you will send the one to Clement and the other to Grapti. And Clement will send his to foreign countries, for permission has been granted to him to do so. So Clement was ordered, actually by the angel from heaven, to make copies of the shepherd of Hermas, Hermas's book, and send them to the foreign countries. So we know that Hermas and Clement were contemporaries, and everyone knows that Clement of Rome was the bishop of Rome in the first century. So we know that this could not be a second century document, which is so often claimed falsely by Catholic scholars. The shepherd of Hermas was widely regarded as scripture by the majority of the earliest Christians, but was rejected by the later Roman Catholic councils, Hippo and Carthage. According to Hermas and the earliest Roman Christians, Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit manifest in the flesh rather than an alleged God the Son in the flesh. And I'm quoting from the Shepherd of Hermas, Parable 5-6, written by Hermas of Rome in the first century who personally knew the Apostle Paul. And I quote, The pre-existent Holy Spirit, which created all things, did God make to dwell in a body of flesh chosen by himself? Parable 5-6 is obviously talking about the pre-existent Holy Spirit being the Spirit who incarnated himself in the body of Jesus Christ. Hermas further wrote that the Holy Spirit is the Son of God. And I quote from the Shepherd of Hermas, Similitude 9-1. The Holy Spirit that spoke with you in the form of the church showed you for that spirit is the Son of God. Notice, Hermas wrote, the Holy Spirit. This was an angel speaking to Hermas. The Holy Spirit that spoke with you, that spirit is the Son of God. Now we can see why Hermas was rejected from the canon of New Testament Scripture. Because the Trinity teaches that the Holy Spirit is not the Son and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. Yet the earliest Christian witness in Rome taught that the Holy Spirit is the Son of God. The Apostle Paul taught the same when he wrote, We preach not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord, in 2 Corinthians 4, 5. And in context, he wrote, The Lord is the Spirit, in 2 Corinthians 3, 17. So since Christ Jesus is the Lord, the Lord Jesus is the Spirit. Since Christ Jesus is Lord, he must be the divine spirit incarnate as a true man. So even the Apostle Paul said that Jesus is Lord, and Jesus being the Lord is the Spirit. According to Trinitarian theology, the Holy Spirit is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. Well, the divinity of Jesus has to be the Holy Spirit incarnate, because that's exactly what the Bible says in Matthew 1.20 and in Luke 1.35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit came down from heaven. The child which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, out of the Holy Spirit's essence of being. Ignatius was appointed the third bishop of Antioch by the Apostle John himself within the first century. Ignatius followed the theological teachings of the Apostle John by writing, and I quote, God himself being manifested in human form for the renewal of eternal life. And now that took a beginning which had been prepared by God. Ephesians 
End quote. Notice that Ignatius had taught that God himself was manifested in human form, just like it says in 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifested in the flesh. And that the Son of Man, or the, and that the Son is the man who took a beginning after being prepared by God in his foreknown plan from the foundation of the world. So notice that this text of Ignatius to the Ephesians 19.3 says that God was manifested in a human form as a human being, and now that took a beginning. Notice, God manifested himself, and the Son took a beginning, which had been prepared by God. God, as God, does not take a beginning, but the Son took a beginning because the Son was granted a life in himself by the Father, according to John 5.26. So here we can see the distinction between the Father, God, himself was manifested in the flesh in human form and the son when the god was manifested as a man he took a beginning because that had been prepared by god from the foundation of the world 1 peter 1 20 says the son was foreknown before the foundation of the world because god had pre-planned all things through his own express thought so Ignatius had taught that God himself was manifested in human form and that the Son is the man who took a beginning. The Apology of Aristides of Athens is dated to 125 AD. Now this is only 25 years after the death of the Apostle John, give or take a few years. So about close to 25 years after the death of the last Apostle of the original 12. According to the early 2nd century Christians, in the Apology of Aristides of Athens, God came down from heaven and from a Hebrew virgin assumed and clothed himself with flesh. And the Son of God lived in a daughter of man. Notice that after God came down from heaven, Jesus said, I came down from heaven in John 6, 38. It was then that the Son of God lived in a daughter of man. Notice that the Son of God is not mentioned as living until the virgin conception. The Apology of Aristides of Athens, section 2, dated to about 125 A.D. Wherefore, the scriptural and historical evidence proves that the first and early second century apostolic church believed in oneness theology, which is the same theology of the modalistic monarchians, who were the most prominent Christian group in the early days of Christianity. For the one God of the Old Testament also became the Son of God with a new human life in the New Testament in order to save his people from their sins. For more videos like this one, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit us on the web at apostolicchristianfaith.com. God bless.